I'm Dane Rose, and in this video I'll be discussing the science of grounded imagination as I first began to conceptualize it when I designed my homeschooling program. Now, imagination we all know about, and it's simply, you know, coming up with images that are vivid enough that we can, in our mind and in the feelings they produce, live in that world. It's a virtual reality. But imagination affects the body, uh, it creates feelings, and if we're vivid and, you know, in a low sensory environment, they, they can be as real as any other reality. You know, we just have to calm down the body. Now, what makes imagination so powerful is that it can take you absolutely anywhere. You can go to any point in time. You can go to any space. You can turn into any shape. You can go as far and as nuanced as you want to take, you know, a, a trip. Now, what makes imagination kind of difficult as a science or sometimes hard to understand what its value is, is when it's ungrounded. For example, if I just imagine a, a, a money tree where you just walk into the garden and, you know, there's thousand dollar bills on all the trees in the garden. Now, it's not that this wouldn't be an enjoyable fantasy. It's just that if you were starting a business, this would not be particularly useful because there are no money trees, literally. So how does grand, grounded imagination differ from imagination in general? Well, you scan, first of all, you start with an intention. You start with a goal, you start with an intention with a clear intention that's written down. Next, you imagine everything that seems within the realm of possibility. So money trees, not so much, but you know, I could start a dry cleaning business. I've, I've heard of those. I could imagine that someone um, might be lonely and depressed and suicidal. And you know, what about a business helping people who wanted to live, but they wanted to die. And so your job would be to uh, help them, you know, shift their perspective uh, and reality from, you know, feeling so miserable they were thinking of killing themselves to actually feeling really excited. Um, and since, you know, depression and suicide hits very wealthy people as well as anyone else, um, this could be quite a talent, uh, particularly if you've got a reputation that you can, within a matter of 30 days, uh, using a systematic approach, take someone who's regularly thinking of dying and, you know, so this is within the realms of, possi of possibility. It's not terribly probable because, you know, we don't see that around. It would take some work. So this is a, you know, this is becoming more grounded. Money tree, you know, suicide transformer, so to speak. You, you, you take it down into, you know, more groundedness. Would I, could I imagine me being good at that? So I can imagine that position being there. Could I imagine me being good at that? Um, okay, I can imagine me being good at, so you take it down a step further. So what would I need to do to make that happen? Well, I'd probably need to start writing articles. I'd maybe I'd need to write a book because nobody knows about it. I mean, I've never heard of a, a suicide transformer. Um, I mean, sure, there's people that will threaten to lock you up if you kill yourself, which is a little bit of an empty threat. Uh, and there's laws that make it illegal to kill yourself, a little bit you know, hard to send a corpse to jail. Um, you know, but we come up with, with uh, idiotic approaches like this. And, you, and this also should give you some comfort because when you start realizing the, 
you know, the, the idiocy of so much of our reality, you realize that someone had to have imagined that at some point. You know, someone had to say, gee, there's a lot of our people killing themselves. Um, you know, uh, and that it doesn't look good. You know, it doesn't look good. You know, we have to listen to this. I know. Um, well, could you imagine a law banning people from committing suicide? Why not? We're legislators. Um, is it going to be very effective of the dead? Well, we, you know, we can say we did something. We've banned, we've banned suicide. It'll make the parents of, of uh, dead children feel a little bit more comforted that, um, you know, their children were breaking the law and they were right. And so let, you know, let's, let's do, let's do this. So, uh, so someone thought of every crazy thing on the planet and there's a lot of crazy things on the planet and it exists. So, you know, but we're coming down in the realm of possibility. And then if you think, well, let's get a little bit more specific. I need $10,000 in the next 90 days. Can I imagine starting a new industry, developing skills in it, marketing myself, finding what does and doesn't work, uh, and reaching a price point of 10000 or whatever in 90 days. Uh, that's, a, that's quite a tough one, particularly if your rent is going to be due at that point. So, you know, it's a, sh it's a shaky thing, but someday, sometime, somehow, in the realm of possibility, not very probable. Um, so this is an example of imagination coming down into more and more of a grounded, uh, you know, reality. And what you want to do is scan many different situations and then narrow them down to the things that are most grounded. And when I say grounded, I mean solid. Um, and so there's a couple. So what makes something solid? You know, since, as I say, you can imagine anything, certainly anything you can imagine, you can imagine. Um, but what makes it solid is, is, it, is the intersection points with reality. So we all live within time. We all live within space. We all live within budgets. We all live within native abilities. We live within the laws of physics. We, you know, so there's a, there's a whole series of different vectors with reality. And so the process of grounded imagination is you, ex you go into a lot of unknown terrain and then you start sifting those possibilities down and you find which of those possibilities, which of those things you've imagined intersects with the most reality vectors. It would work within the time. I have the temperament. I have enough cash flow to get it started. You know, if you're thinking of starting a bank, you know, I've got $50 in my wallet isn't going to cut it. If you're thinking of starting a landscape business, that was my business I started at age 17. That's all I needed, $50. Just enough money to drop a flyer, you know, and, you know, take it to the photocopier and go door to door at age 17 and you know, I'm one of your neighbors. These are the things I know how to do. Um, so if I can be of any assistance, uh, don't hesitate to give me a call. Here's my number, list of things to do, hourly rate. Let me leave you with a copy of my flyer. So done. You know, it's it. I liked gardening. I believed in gardening. Uh, people had gardens. Gardening was not a, you know, an industry from outer space. People, you know, it's, it's, it's a known industry. I had certain experience with gardening. Um, I needed time to study and gardening with a Walkman was a great way to do all kinds of studying. And so in short, gardening was a great area for, you know, all of my values, experiences, the needs of the neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an imagination. I thought of a number of different things that I could do uh, at age 17, but gardening uh, was, and particularly organic and sustainable gardening, was you know hot on the list, so it kind of made that cut 
through all those different vector filters. Now in design, uh, as a landscape designer, there's a similar type of design discipline. And in design, you look at the value hierarchy of the client and, well, how do you know that? Well, you ask them, you say, you know, would, what's more important to you, saving money right now or, you know, the finest craftsmanship? One client says this, one client says this. What's more important to you, uh, adding money to real estate value or pleasing your personal taste? Meaning a client that likes a purple fountain uh, might not add any money to real estate value, but they might be very happy with that purple fountain, that client. And so then you need to know, you know, if they think the average buyer is going to love that purple fountain, they need to be informed that probably not going to do it, you know. But if it's just for them, they should have whatever they want. And so there's a hierarchy of values. And then there's what's locally available. I mean, you can't do things that, you know, I have no idea where to find that material it, or it doesn't exist. Then there's, does it fit within the budget? Then there's how much maintenance do you want to do and will it fit within the maintenance abilities and the maintenance budget? Then there's practical things like, do we know how to install it? Do we know how to do that particular design? That, you know, it's got to be doable. Uh, so, but if the client likes it and it fits within the value hierarchy and it fits within the budget and it fits within the maintenance ability and, you know, the, if it's a plant, if it's suitable and will actually grow in that light and it filters down and what remains is something that survives all of that scrutiny and is grounded in reality. It starts off as imagination like every single thing in human history it all began with a thought. In this case, let's have a garden. Um, and maybe a garden in this style or this type of look, and I like these photos. So it all starts as an imagination. But the one that makes the cut of all the millions and millions of possible things that you could do has to go through this sifting process. And it needs to sift through every vector, you know, every vector of reality. If there are building codes that are involved, it has to pass building code. If there are neighbors involved, the neighbors have to be comfortable with it. If it's if there are laws involved, it, you know, it has to be within the law. You know, you get the idea. If it's electricity, it has to be within the power consumption of that particular property. And so it has to make the cut. So this is grounded imagination, and the discipline and the practice of grounded imagination as a science is the discipline and the practice of understanding the goal and the value, then going way out there and looking at all these possibilities, and then sifting them through so that what you end up with is something that's eminently doable, and the most useful thing that you can possibly do of all those ideas. You know, so uh, what, another way to say that would be return on investment. That this idea out of all ideas gives a stunning return on investment uh, to the client, to the neighbors, to the, you know, to the landscape, to the values, etc., etc. So this is grounded imagination. And I studied this because I couldn't think of a more useful discipline to practice and study in any field. And so this is the kind of the foundation. Now, what's, because one of the reasons I'm making this video is in response to, um, you know, I'm putting out thousands of hours of kind of, sifted thoughts and brainstorming and mullings and assessments and uh, you know an obvious question since I don't hold a PhD in any of these topics is where is this coming from so the central paradigm is grounded imagination 
but it has a couple of different spokes. And so I'll kind of walk you through my own understanding of that. So the first thing is, you know, the database from which I'm drawing. Um, you know, in order to ground something in, and make it practical, you, you've got to have a certain degree of con context that gives you confidence that, you know, I've seen something like that. So based on this and this, I'm pretty sure this could work. So I've lived in Sussex, England. I've lived in Scotland. I've lived in Cyprus. I've lived in Vancouver, Canada. I've lived in several parts of the United States and I've lived in Thailand. Um, and I've spent time in Philippines and in Copenhagen and France and Italy. And uh, so these different cultures give you a little bit of sense. Every culture is a little different and there are different norms. Like I remember the time in England when, um, you know, having come over from the US, where I would see these giant locks and these huge keys, like these cast steel keys. And it's like, what are they doing with these? They were easy to pick. They were heavy. They took tons of metal. And they were, you know, they were big. And it just seemed insane that you'd go down to a brand new hardware store in present day England and buy a lock and key that wasted 300% more metal, was 300% easier to pick, was 300% heavier and bigger for no good reason. It just didn't make any sense, but that's the way they had done it there before. But there were plenty of things the other way around, like low flush toilets, I saw them in England, years and years before I saw my first low flush toilet in the United States, and it's like, why? Why is no one just getting in a plane saying there's a better way of doing things and changing? But that's not how countries and cultures seem to work. They, they do what they do for their own bizarre reasons and screw what everyone else is doing, even though it's a lot better. So this in itself is an interesting database. It, it, it starts to spark the mind that there's always a better way and there's probably someone out there doing it. And so that's a bias of mine. If anything is not really excellent, certainly as good as I can imagine, and it's not a pleasure to use and all that, my mind goes to there is someone out there doing a much better job of this somewhere um, and I don't have to accept a mediocre status quo. Uh, and a little bit of that comes from living in different places. Then there's around, uh, let's just say, 800 books. Uh, I know I have a, you know, 550 Audible library, you know, much of which I've, you know, consumed in the last four years, um, and you know, and so there's a lot of of database. I'm interested in business. I'm interested in psychology. I'm interested in consciousness. I'm interested in ecology. I'm interested in culture. Uh, you know, I'm interested in happiness, in lifestyle, in science. And I'm interested in how all these disciplines work together. And so, you know, that's kind of the stuff that's on my uh, libraries. And I love listening to great people do successful things who completely disagree with each other. You know, you listen to Brian Tracy, and it's all about organizing and pinning things down and discipline and time management. You listen to someone else, you know, like Diamandis, and it's all about charisma and positive energy. And, and so, oh, okay, Diamandis leads with positive energy, uh, and, you know, Tracy leads with, you know, meticulous planning and ethics and th stuff like that. And so you see they both succeed. And so you learn there's many ways of doing things. And this kind of breaks down the idea of dogma or ultimate truth. Like there's one way and that's the way to do it. And so this leads me to an awareness that there's not just one way and probably the best way for me or for you is going to be to play to your uniqueness and your strengths. Uh, so this is a data set. And then, you know, I've been a designer and you know, over the last 25 years, 
20% to 30% of what I do every single year is one of a kind and kind of new. It's either completely new or it's new to me. And in those situations, I use grounded imagination. I, you know, I, I'll use visualization to walk myself through, you know, this and that. Like this month, I'm planting uh, 20 foot tall olive trees using a specific type of equipment, and they weigh around 8,000 pounds. And I want to, you know, get get things moving on the road very fast, uh, so there's no traffic issues. Um, and so. Um, you know, so I've, I've made a custom harness uh, out of 30,000 pound tow ropes, uh, you know, lots of redundancy, et cetera, so that, you know, I can, can do that. And I'll probably, who knows, I may never do that again and for the rest of the life. I've never done it before, but this is where grounded imagination comes in. And I'm successful at inventing new things, be it building a house successfully on time and on budget for the first time in my life, or you know this, that, and the other. I'm successful at that a good 90 plus percent of the time. And my failures tend to be much more along the lines of connecting with people. And a lot of what I diagnose around that is that uh, in the black swan, the author outlines that it takes a competent person to evaluate the competency of someone who's competent. Someone who's incompetent can't evaluate their own competency and they can't evaluate any other competency. And 90 plus percent success in new and innovative things is pretty high competence. And it's, it's higher than average. You know, the, 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 the typical person who hasn't, you know, studied this for 20 or 30 years is not going to have, you know, a 90% success rate doing something completely new that they haven't done of a technical nature. And so one of the things that I've realized is that most people just don't like new things, but they also don't have the, the training to measure what is and is not good design. And so while I might be really excited because I figured out how to save 50% energy, which turns into time and money and resources and all that, and you know speed things up another 50% and do this. And so I'm really excited like, wow, and I did all that for $200 in materials and stuff. You know, it's a, you know, it's a big design breakthrough in efficiency. Um, but if someone else can't pace through the expenditures of energy and all the different alternatives, they may not be in the slightest bit impressed. In fact, they may be less impressed with that innovation than they would be impress impressed with some fancy machine that took twice as long, that cost 10 times more money, and didn't do any better. Because they don't have the discernment to measure energy investment per result, return on investment, in design areas. But they do have the ability to say, that looks pretty impressive. I mean, wow, all those smoke and big humming, whirring dials. Well, whoa, you know, you, you're really professional. And so, you know, some of my failure is attributed to in the people area is simply because it takes a very competent designer to understand nuances of competent design. And we don't teach grounded imagination in college and, and high school. If they did, I probably wouldn't have left high school uh, to do my own homeschooling. They don't, we don't teach that. And so, you know, there's not that many people who are competent. But I get on very well with, you know, the top two percent of highly competent people uh, because I appreciate them and they appreciate me. Um, I do very poorly with the bottom 50 percent of competent people uh, because it's so easy to see more competent ways of doing things, but they don't have the competency to see that. 
I don't like criticizing people, and there's an incredible amount of incompetent stuff out there. And I'm probably digging myself into an elitist hole here, which is not one of my strengths. You know, I have engineering type uh, strengths, and I always tell the truth as I see it. It's not always um, politically correct, shall we say. Uh, and so, you know, forgive me. Uh, but so, so this is my data set. And the next prong in this, in my relationship with truth, because I'm doing a lot of, kind of espousing of ideas and things in different video channels and stuff, is first of all, that there is no absolute truth. That truth is an effective, competent narrative that the human brain and human consciousness is capable of understanding that is useful because it predicts useful information most of the time. So in other words, you know, if you're gambling and flipping a coin, it's not terribly useful. You're going to lose half the time, you're going to win half the time, you might as well just guess. Um, though in some cases, flipping a coin will increase your odds over guessing if, if you think you're right and you don't know what you're doing. So if you can get to a point where a truth or a belief or a set of mental emotional algorithms gets you to where you want to go 70% of the time, you're way ahead of average, you know, because gets me there half the time, half the time it doesn't. It's not a terribly good f philosophy or, or working model. But if you understand that we're not dealing with absolute truth, we're dealing with an effective model of truth. And so it's, it needs to be measured in terms of its effectiveness, its impact. You know, this is, you know, one thing I used to have a little bit with my father who loved to spout out about, you know, all kinds of different truths and, you know, theories and this and that and the other. Um, I would just ask him, I'd say, Dad, what are you going to do differently to improve your life or the family's life in the next month with whatever it is you just said? Anything? Well, it's, it's not terribly useful then because, you know, you've got a lot on your plate and we've got a lot on our plate. And why don't you find something to think about that would actually move some of that along? And if it moves along, I'm happy to hear the theory. Uh, you know, what do I think about the conjunction of, you know, Saturn and such and such with this and that and the other? And mm, not so interesting. So first of all, true enough, not absolute truth. Secondly, uh, useful truth. Um, and thirdly, it's, it's not an either or truth. For example, you have, you know, little stories like Aesop's fables. They have useful truths. You know, you have the, the one with the little chicken and the chicken says, you know, will you help me harvest the rice? And the, the, the pig says, no, 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 I'm busy. I don't want to help you harvest the rice. And will you help me, uh, you know, uh, plant the rice? No, I don't want to do that. And will you help me water the rice? And no, I don't want to do that. And, and, and then finally, of course, the pig wants to come and eat the rice. And the chicken says, no, you, you wouldn't do any of the work to, to, to get the rice made. And, and so you don't get to have any. And you know, you, you get what you pay for. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and if you understand that, then you can start to understand where and how you're paying for the lunch that you think is free, uh, because it's not free. Um, and so whether you're paying for it in, in, in uh, establishing a bad vibe with your host who you never reciprocate with, and so you're losing the relationship or uh, whether it's someone uh, preparing to go to bed with you because now you owe them with the free, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And so Aesop's fables can tell certain useful truths. And, but 
there's the story of, you know, the, the, the chicken that's motivating. But then there are other stories about the fox who tricks and, you know, and outwits. And they're both true. In other words, you can, you can, you know, the, the, the fox lures the chicken out to admire, you know, be admired and then gets eaten, you know. And, and so there's, there's, and you say, yeah, that happens too. It happens that lazy people get, you know, go without food. It happens that, you know, uh, vain people get suckered. Uh, it happens that, uh, you know, sociopathic trickster energy, you know, consumes the naive. All of that happens. It's not one or the other. And so one of the things that, you know, I look at in the models of truth, in the models of reality, is... Is it something that limits truth or has room for all of them? For example, all truths are true some of the time in a certain context is a very big truth because you're not in any conflict with that. Because even the person that says, no, 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 that's not true. All truths do not fit all of the time. If you believe that they do, then you also know that that person is right some of the time. Meaning there's probably a situation where all truths wouldn't apply. So you can agree with them. They won't agree with you, but you're agreeing with them. And the person who agrees with the most people who are looking honestly at reality is the person with the biggest perspective. And to get the biggest perspective when reality is way bigger than we are as human beings, you need to be outside the set looking at from different time frames, different lenses, different values, different paradigms, different angles. And that's when you can start to see, oh, that's true from this perspective. That's true from this perspective. That was true at this time. This is true from this paradigm. I notice this that I didn't notice when I look through this lens. I notice this that I didn't see through this lens. I see microbes when I look through a microscope. I see birds when I look through my eyes. I see ultraviolet light when I look through night binoculars. Wow, there's a lot to see out there. And it's all true some of the time. And so one of the things that, you know, I just look for is can it be true and bigger? So in other words, a metric for me of success and growth and perspective is if I can see everything someone said and say, yep, I can see all that. And I also see that reality is bigger than that. I also see the other person's perspective to some degree. And I see if there's a conflict, if they think, you can't be right because I'm right, and you can't be right because I'm right, how they're both right from certain angles, if they're being honest. I mean, if someone's just patently lying, I'm not talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about two people who genuinely see things by emphasizing different details through different values, through different paradigms at different times with different past histories. And so um, I consider it a, a, a state you know, a gradient of more and more and more true, the more truth is contained, you know, within the picture. So this is another uh, thing. And I see my own perspective and truth as being a work in progress, as being a, a process that's refined over time, and it's delightful when I change my mind. I mean, I love that. Uh, I, I think it's so much fun to, you know, I remember when I went from the US over to England and there were things that I didn't like in England. And after about two years, I started liking some of those things. And then I came back to America, I actually went to Canada, and then there were things that I didn't like there that I'd grown to like in England. And then I grew to like those, and then I went back to the US And then there were things that I hated in the United States that I don't notice anymore. And it's like, yes, it's it's wonderful to see how perspective changes with time and in different contexts and just, you know, getting used to something. So this is, uh, you know, this is kind of, 
I see this as kind of a six-sided concept. And so steady improvement, both and, and the wisest view includes the most, you know, the most valid perspectives that can be uh, spoken about. Another important kind of part of this science and this kind of matrix for me from which I speak is the awareness that, um, first of all, I, I learn and I integrate by speaking. And so a lot of what I'd say, at least 80% of what I say, I'm saying it for the first time. And how it works for me is I'm out in the walk or I'm cooking or eating, etc. And a pattern, I see a pattern come together. And I see some usefulness of the pattern. So I want to explore it. And the best way I know how to explore it is to put it into words. And the best know, way I know to hold my attention is at present to make a video. Sometimes it's writing, typing, writing a book or something like that. But making a video really holds my attention because I'm putting myself in another person's perspective who hasn't heard what I'm having to say. And I'm trying to bridge the gap between us. And I'm, I'm listening because I've had a lot of conversations in life. Do I think that this or this person would be able to, first of all, grasp why I think the, you know, the concept is valuable, grasp what the concept is, and understand the pattern enough to be able to relate to it and agree with it, um, or perhaps come up with a better idea. So, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to, and if I do that well, then I come out on the other side clearer about what I think, you know, a, a sense of satisfaction to work through that design and that idea in real time. I don't, you know, usually write notes and stuff, you know, ahead of time. Um, and what I'm always doing is casting my mind out into the unknown and into imagination, back into the past, into the future, as I best I think is probable to occur, and into the data sets of all the books and things that I've read. Now, as I do that, because I'm not preparing and taking notes, there is a lot of time where, you know, my memory is by no means, uh, you know, pristine. And so there's a lot of times where I remember a narrative and I remember, all that I remember is that I was, I was impressed with it at the time. You know, I was confident that, you know, that's, that's, that's interesting. That makes sense. That would be useful in this situation. Uh, I want to remember that, but maybe I don't remember exactly where the source was or the exact date. Sometimes I don't remember the name of the person who did the study or et cetera. And so um, as I'm t referencing it, I'm often aware that uh, I could get the date wrong or this wrong. And I try and be vague enough so that I'm not, you know, patently misstating it. But I'm also, if, if I am stating a specific thing and I can't remember the exact source, um, I also question if I'm confident based on what I've seen and, and know that if that isn't true, something similar is. And so the point is valid, even if the date is wrong on this or the amount was wrong on this, that the point is still valid. And you know, and that I'm confident if I took 20 or 30 minutes, uh, which I'm not going to do unless it becomes relevant, that I can find the narrative that would illustrate that point at, at least as good as the example I'm using. Um, you know, and so if I, you know, if I'm doing a, a, a study, you know, if I'm talking about discipline in children and, you know, and referencing a study, um, you know, that even if that study was completely false, you know, that I'm confident based on personal experience that another study will exist that 
validate some points. So this is a little bit gray, um, and it's an area that uh, until there's weight on something, you know, until there's millions of dollars at stake, etc., uh, that it just doesn't seem worth the effort to figure out, you know, the exact quote, for example. Louis Pasteur comes to mind because um, on one of, in one of my books, it was quoted that, you know, Louis Pasteur discovered germ theory, and there was the whole story about, you know, how doctors were killing their surgery patients, etc. But then when I went to look it up on my own, it turned out that it could be that someone else discovered germ th theory, and then that story wasn't told. But both of those narratives were to illustrate a bigger point that stands alone, which is that in a materialistic paradigm, there have always been people who, if they don't see it right in front of their eyes, they don't believe it. And that's the point that is true, even if Louis Pasteur never existed. And so there's those kinds of things which um, I feel about 20%, you know, uneasy about my vagueness in some of those but very confident in the underlying message that there's truth in the underlying message. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, that leg of this paradigm. Um, and, you know, if it was going to be, uh, you know, a significant piece of writing that was going to influence a lot of people, I'd probably, because I'm a little impatient in that area, I'd probably hire a research team to really check, you know, every little nuance that I'm saying. Um, which just doesn't seem relevant since I'm largely in a state of finding my voice uh, and building ideas right now as opposed to trying to perfect references. Um, the other thing that's really important to me in this framework, as I talked about things being true enough, um, and you know, I talked about you know, my personal experience with implementing ideas, whatever they are, is that I'm successful 85 to 98% of the time when I'm dealing with things. Like if I want to weld something or, you know, operate a piece of equipment or this uh, in a particular way or write a book or, you know, come up with a graphic idea or build a piece of furniture or, you know, come up with an interesting house design. You know, these types of things, they work really well. You know, and then with getting people to go along with new paradigms, etc., you know, not so much. But when dealing with people, you know, and particularly when sharing, you know, ideas and advice that might be acted on, the first thing I would say is I look at what I'm saying as a starting point and as an abstraction to begin working with. And I think the process that anything that I say in that context of like an abstract video about culture or something should be taken as, is as a starting idea to begin filtering through to become a part of that grounded imagination paradigm for that person in particular. You know, does that line up with their value? Does that line up with what can be done on their land, in their country, in their place, etc., to, you know, to go through those sifting things? Um, so that's, you know, one thing. But the other thing is um, if I'm working with someone and there have been there have only been really three people in my life who have deeply and fully embraced my guidance system, what I've just been outlining here, to radically transform their lives, meaning in my personal life. And, you know, one of them is my, my assistant, and one of them is my wife, and another is a former lover. And you know, the same kind of success ratios that I applied for myself. These are the only people who have, at this moment in time, 
deeply and fully embraced the you know suggested actions and ideas to tr- to transform their lives and in every case there has been an exponential explosion of success so you know if it's with my wife looking at a 4000 uh, percent increase in life skills you know over the last 2 years or my assistant uh, improving uh, about uh, it's probably about 3000 percent in in work skills over the last 5 years while simultaneously doubling income while simultaneously going from working uh, 12 hours a day down to 3 hours a day so we've got you know, an infusion of life skills, a doubling of income, an improvement of marriage, you know, and fatherhood, and decreasing work by 400% all at the same time. I mean, that's a useful technology, you know, that's a useful shift. Um, You know, and that's also, you know, where I've been coming from that is, is, you know, I started my business when I was 17, uh, making $10 an hour. And, you know, since that time, you know, going up to hundreds of dollars an hour and more and more latitude, more and more flexibility and freedom and taking six months of the year off, working a few hours a day, most days that I work. Um, Again, more and more freedom, more and more life skills, more and more free time, more and more money, you know, those are interesting skills. And similarly with my wife, again, reducing work hours, increasing life skills, increasing money. Uh, And so, you know, that's, and, and, you know, my uh, ex-girlfriend, again, reducing expenses, building significant skills, uh, increasing money, um, freeing up time, you know, doing more self-investment by hundreds of percent, etc. So that's that's an area that I guess a hundred percent of the people who have you know taken what I've had to say and and worked with it have have all increased money, increased free time, dramatically impre- increased skills, uh, increased well-being, um, and you know, so more more time, higher skills, more well-being, more money, less n- having to work less. So that's you know that that's I I I, I think that's a pretty good skill set or or sample base. Um, but if I see you know with anyone, everyone has been very different, and so it's. You have the abstract ideas, the starting point. Then you've got to have a feedback loop. You know, with every single person, I've done it kind of one-on-one with, like, tell me what happened when you did this. Okay, so refine the protocol. Tell me what happened when you did that. Okay, refine the protocol. Tell me what happened when you, okay, refine the protocol. Aha, that one's working. Now let's go over to this area. So it's a dialogue. It's not a dogma. Dogmas you hold on to them even if they don't work. Dialogue, if that's not working, you figure out why and you change, etc. Um, so then it's all ultimately about evidence. You know, I wouldn't consider a coaching or anything like that or a lecture or a friendship or advice or anything to be a successful protocol if the person did those things and didn't actually experience success. Um, and so, you know, that's ultimately, with grounded imagination, what you want to end up with is that someone is succeeding, but not just succeeding, but succeeding more while spending less energy than before, less pollution, less resources, less time, less stress, etc. succeeding more. And so this is... Um, you know, paradigm. And one of the truths that I've added most recently is 10x thinking. Uh, It's, you know, and that ties in with, um, we go back to the usefulness of truths. 
and the fact that they're not absolute. And if you see truths as tools, and the real question is, will this tool take me where I want to go? Will this vehicle of thinking and feeling take me where I want to go? And if it does, it's a useful vehicle, it's a useful tool. And if you think of truths and philosophies also a little bit like apps in a phone, like this one will take a good photo, this one will help you edit it, this one will add a funny rabbit face on. There are different apps, different programs, different overlays, and you work together. You use this bit of software for this, then you transfer it into this, then you move it over here. It's a series of different, uh, you know, of, of different tools that you're using for different things. And much like physics, there is no unified theory. You know, Einstein and many physics, they dream of it, but there's no unified theory. Uh, not in medicine, not in physics and stuff, stuff, stuff works, you know, this works with the subatomic par particles, this works with the atomic and up particles. Well, they, they don't seem to make sense together. It's similar with an app. This helps with this, this helps with this. They don't quite mesh. They're different apps, different programs. And so that's also, uh, when I look at a truth, uh, anywhere. It's not only is it useful, would it be a useful addition to my tool bag? How would I use it? In what context? And that's ultimately, I think, what takes the most experience and practice and life skill to develop is the discernment of which tools will help you in particular do what that you value. Because when you know that, you can start just pulling out this tool for this context and this tool for this other context. So this completes the six-sided kind of, or six facets of what for me is a science of grounded imagination uh, that I studied, that I apply, and that is my reference point. I could say my sole reference point. I'm referencing this, these six facets uh, as I speak, uh, being aware that the probability field is good. The probability field is good that using this technology in this way will improve well-being more than it takes it away. Um, and of course, the devil is in the details and in the individual. And I also encourage anyone who's experiencing something different to pitch it out but hopefully to enjoy taking the time to figure out exactly why, uh, because that's part of what brings confidence, not just running away from something because it's, it's not working, but you know, figuring out, letting that teach you something about who you are uniquely as a human being.